Stars come in a wide variety of masses and sizes, from a bit larger than one-tenth the mass of the Sun to over a hundred times the mass of the Sun. From one-tenth the diameter of the Sun to thousands of times the diameter of the Sun. But not all masses and sizes are equally likely. The vast majority of stars have masses smaller than the mass of the Sun, while larger masses are much more rare. Stars with masses 10 times the mass of the Sun are a thousand times more rare than the Sun. Some stars, like the Sun, are isolated. Others come in pairs and they are called binary stars. And yet other stars may have two or more companions, like Polaris. But again, not all companions are equally likely. More than half of all stars come in multiple systems. And the larger the mass of the star, the higher the probability that it comes in a multiple system. Stars over 10 solar masses are very rarely isolated. Why do stars have different masses? Why are some binary, triple or multiple while others are isolated? How do stars form with such a large variety of properties? Although over the last 60 years we've learned a lot, these are all still open questions and we still lack full understanding of the process of star formation. The way stars form is a subject of intense research in astrophysics today. We shall discuss some basic facts and on the way the difficulty of the task will become apparent. As with everything else, the story begins with a big bang. In the beginning, there was only hot gas that cooled down and progressively gave rise to all the structure we see around us in the universe. But stars did not all form at once sometime in the young universe. The formation of stars keeps going on even today at a rate of approximately one solar mass per year in our galaxy. Stars form by the condensation of diffuse gas that exists in the space between them. Contrary to the common belief, the space between stars is not empty. Everything that exists between stars is called the interstellar medium and is made of gas, dust, light, cosmic rays and magnetic fields. These are the ingredients out of which stars are formed and we shall examine them first before we talk about the recipe. Ptolemy in Almagest and the Persian astronomer Abd al-Rahman al-Sufi in his book of fixed stars noted for the first time patches of diffuse emission in the night sky that we now know to be galaxies. But it was the French astronomer Nicolas Claude Fabry de Piresque who first discovered with the use of a telescope in 1610 a real cloud of gas in space, the Orion Nebula. The use of telescopes led to the rapid discovery of luminous nebulae, and over a century later, in 1780s, Charles Mesnier compiled his famous catalogue of over 100 nebulae, now called Messier objects, which also include several galaxies. Messier was actually interested in the discovery of comets, and his catalogue was meant to help distinguish nebulae from the moving comets. Indeed, he discovered many comets, but ironically he was more famous for his catalogue of the non-moving diffuse bright objects. Whether these nebulae were actual clouds of gas in space or clusters of stars so close together that they are not resolved and appear fuzzy was debated until 1865. That is when William Huggins used spectroscopy to demonstrate that some of those bright nebulae were indeed showing characteristic signatures of hot gas, while others were indeed unresolved star clusters or even galaxies as we now know today. After the establishment of the existence of bright clouds of gas in space came the discovery of dark clouds. 
German-born British astronomer William Herzl first noticed what he called holes in the heavens, dark patches where stars seemed to be absent. In the beginning of the 20th century, Edward Barnard studied them systematically and compiled the first catalogue. We now know that these dark areas are due to the dense clouds of gas and dust that obscure the background stars. But all these clouds were considered isolated and interspersed between stars in an otherwise empty space. It was in the early 20th century that the idea of a general, diffuse interstellar medium that occupies all space between stars emerged. It was based on the spectral properties of the light of stars. The light emitted by stars, when analyzed by a prism, contains all colors. The stars shine in all frequencies, like any other object that is heated up, like, say, an incandescent lamp. But if we analyze the light emitted by a hot gas, like in a fluorescent lamp, we see that it contains only specific colors in narrow frequency bands called spectral lines. This is the result of the quantum nature of atoms. The electrons that revolve around the nucleus of atoms can only have discrete and specific energies different for different atoms. An electron can jump from one energy state to another by absorbing or emitting light with an amount of energy exactly equal to the energy difference of the two states. The energy of light is directly related to its frequency. The higher the frequency, the larger the energy of the light. So these jumps of the electrons of a gaseous element from one energy level to another result in the appearance of the spectral lines. The spectral line may be observed either as an emission line or an absorption line. Which type of line is observed depends on the type of material and its temperature relative to the other emission source. An absorption line is produced when photons from a hot, broad-spectrum source pass through a cold material. The intensity of light over a narrow frequency range is reduced due to absorption by the material and re-emission in random directions. By contrast, a bright emission line is produced when photons from a hot material are detected in the presence of a broad spectrum from a cold source. The intensity of light over a narrow frequency range is increased due to emission by the material. The spectral lines are highly atom-specific and, like fingerprints, can be used to identify the chemical composition of any medium capable of letting light pass through it. This is the spectral signature of hydrogen. This is helium, this is carbon, and this is oxygen. In 1904, the German astronomer Johannes Hartmann deduced the presence of the interstellar medium from the study of the spectra of the binary star Delta Orionis. Due to the Doppler effect, the spectral lines in the light emitted from its star shifts first towards the blue, then towards the red. This happens as its star moves first towards us and then away from us, during its motion about their common center of mass with the period of the common orbit. But Hartmann noticed that there were other spectral lines of the element calcium that appeared to remain stationary and not be affected by the motion of the stars. Since no interstellar cloud can be detected towards Delta Orionis, he attributed those to the presence of diffuse gas along the line of sight to the star. Here is a modern example of Delta Orion spectra taking over four nights at the Tautenberg telescope. The broad helium-1 lines are clearly seen shifting due to the motion of the stars, while the nearby narrow spectral lines of sodium-1 remain stationary since they do not originate from the stars, but the interstellar medium that fills the space from the Earth to the star. In the 1930s, Robert Julius Trumpler confirmed the existence of an absorbing diffuse interstellar medium from the extinction of the light of stellar clusters. Stellar clusters appear fainter with distance than they appear smaller with distance. 
So either the larger stellar clusters are preferentially located further away from us, or there is something in between the stars that absorbs light and makes them fainter with distance than we would expect if the space was empty. The first hypothesis violates the Copernican principle that we are not in a special position in the universe and thus we have to accept the second conclusion. Around the same time, the nature of the bright nebula was studied systematically and understood by the Danish astronomer Bengt Stromgren. He realized that all bright nebulae are made of ionized gas that emits light in specific spectral lines, some of which lie in the optical part of the spectrum. So we have three types of bright nebulae. Clouds around young massive stars that emit a lot of ionizing radiation. Planetary nebulae that form when low mass stars die by expelling their outer layers. And supernova remnants that form when massive stars die with an explosion. But most of the gas in the interstellar medium is not near a source of ionization, so it does not emit in the optical part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And since the most abundant element in the universe is hydrogen, the Dutch astronomer van der Hulst predicted in 1945 that neutral hydrogen should emit in the radio waves a spectral line with wavelength of 21 cm when the spins of the electron and the proton of the hydrogen atom flip from parallel to antiparallel. Indeed, a few years later, in 1951, this 21 cm spectral line of hydrogen was detected by American astronomers Ewen and Parcel. This was a very important discovery because the 21 cm line of neutral hydrogen is found everywhere and is used to study the structure of our galaxy and other galaxies and it ushered in the field of radio astronomy. Around the mid-20th century, Molecules were also discovered in space, which came as a great surprise, since chemical reactions that lead to the combination of atoms into molecules was hard to imagine in the extreme low densities of space. Actually, it was the famous English astronomer Sir Arthur Eddington that first predicted the existence of molecular hydrogen in cold and dense interstellar clouds in 1926. But molecular hydrogen does not radiate at low temperatures, so it cannot be directly observed. It was radicals like the cyano radical and the methylodyne radical that were discovered first in the optical spectrum. The advent of radio astronomy led to the discovery of many more molecules in the interstellar medium, at a rate of approximately four new molecules per year. To date, over 200 molecules have been identified in the interstellar medium, even some complicated organic molecules. Our knowledge of the interstellar medium really took off in the space era. Putting telescopes in space opened up parts of the electromagnetic spectrum that were not accessible from the ground, like the infrared, the ultraviolet, the X-rays and the gamma rays. Today we know that the gas in the interstellar medium has a huge range of densities and temperatures but we identify three broad phases. The first one is comprised by the ionized gas that can be very hot, million degrees, 100,000 degrees Kelvin, and tenuous with a density of approximately 0.01 particle per cc, or warm with a temperature of around 10,000 degrees Kelvin and a density of an order of magnitude larger, 0.1 particles per cc. The second phase is the so-called neutral gas phase that can be warm uh, with a temperature of about several thousand degrees Kelvin, six, seven thousand degrees Kelvin, and a density of one particle per cc. Or cold with a temperature of 100 degrees Kelvin approximately and a density of the order of 50 uh, particles per cc. Finally, the densest part is the molecular gas which is very cold with a temperature of only 10 degrees Kelvin and a density of up to a thousand or more particles per cc. 
This may be dense for space, but it's still a thousand times less dense than the best ultra-high vacuum we can achieve here on Earth. We have mapped the whole sky in all parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. We make maps of the whole sky the same way we make maps of Earth. Here is a classic example of a so-called Eye of Projection map of the Earth. And this is a night of projection map of the sky as it appears when we look at it with our eyes in the visible part of the spectrum. The center of our galaxy is placed at the center of the map. Our galaxy is a disk galaxy and as we are located somewhere on the disk it appears as a line on the sky called the galactic plane which in this map is aligned with the horizontal axis. We can see the dense clouds as dark patches obscuring the light of the background stars like holes in the heaven, as Herschel called them. This is the same map, but this time we see a 21 cm emission line of the neutral hydrogen that traces the neutral gas. The plane of the galaxy is very bright, indicating that most of the neutral gas is on the disk of the galaxy, as are most of the stars as well but the gas is a bit more diffuse and it extends further up and below the disk. The molecular gas, which is the densest part of the interstellar medium, cannot be observed directly since molecular hydrogen does not radiate at cold temperatures. But if molecules of hydrogen can form, then other molecules can form as well. And from the many molecules already detected, we usually use the radiation from the carbon monoxide molecule which is very abundant and radiates even at the very cold temperatures of the molecular clouds. This is our map of the sky showing only the radiation of the carbon monoxide molecule. The molecular clouds, the densest part of the interstellar medium, are concentrated almost exclusively on the disk, with very little radiation coming from areas above and below the disk. The ionized gas, on the other hand, looks very different here is a map of the Balmer Alpha line tracing the ionized hydrogen. Supernova remnants, young stars emitting hard UV radiation, ionizing the gas around them. We can still see more activity on the galactic plane, but now there are also a lot of bubbles of ionized gas all over. The even hotter gas emits in the X-ray part of the spectrum and we can see it in this map. Other than some very young supernova remnants, we see a lot of very hot gas located above and below the plane around the galactic center. The second ingredient of the interstellar medium is interstellar dust. It's made of small solid particles from a few hundred molecules to several micrometers in diameter. Our solar system is filled with them and the Earth runs into innumerable such particles every day as it moves around the Sun. In the 90s, scientists collected some extraterrestrial dust grains by flying high at the upper atmosphere. In 2006, NASA's Stardust mission deployed an aerogel and collected dust grains in space that were returned to Earth and studied. Interstellar dust grains have irregular shapes and seem to be conglomerations of smaller specks of material that stuck together after bumping into each other. Interstellar dust grains form from material ejected from stars in the slow winds of red giants or in the gas shot outwards into space when a supernova explodes. As gaseous ejecta expand away from their source, it cools and refractory elements such as aluminum, iron, nickel and silicon condense into solid form when the gas is still warm at temperatures over a thousand degrees Kelvin to form the cores of dust grains. Their total mass is about 1% of the total mass of the gas in interstellar space, but they are very important for several reasons. Dust grains absorb ultraviolet and visible light, and they are responsible of the extinction of the background stars by dense clouds, but they re-emit the radiation in the infrared, 
where the same clouds that appear dark in the optical shine bright in the infrared. We take advantage of this to map the cold and dense part of the interstellar medium in the infrared part of the electromagnetic spectrum. This is an RGB composite map of the infrared radiation emitted by the interstellar dust that is mixed in with the gas made by the IRAS telescope in the 80s. The dust is more concentrated on the disk than the more diffuse neutral atomic gas. The S-shaped feature is the zodiacal light emitted by the hotter dust particles in our solar system. Another very important function of the dust grains is to help interstellar chemistry happen. In fact, the surfaces of dust grains are like little factories, bringing together atoms that might otherwise rarely meet, catalyzing their reaction. In the cold neutral medium, and especially in the dense molecular clouds, lighter elements such as carbon, oxygen and hydrogen gradually adhere to the course of the grain and build up a nice rich mantle. When dust grains are exposed to visible and ultraviolet light, chemical reactions take place in their ice mantles. The simple molecules such as water and carbon monoxide that make up those mantles are broken apart and their atoms recombine to form larger organic compounds like ethanol, for instance. Some of these molecules then evaporate from the surface of the grain and return to the gaseous state, where we can detect them via the emission or in the radio and millimeter waves. Vast amounts of alcohol exist in molecular clouds that was created on the surfaces of interstellar dust grains. The third ingredient is light. Light, or more generally electromagnetic radiation, is a wave of the oscillating electric and magnetic fields in space. Electromagnetic waves are transverse waves like the waves on a stream or the waves on the surface of a lake when it is disturbed. But it is the electric and the magnetic field that is oscillating rather than the stream or the surface of the lake. Like all transverse waves, they are characterized by their wavelength, their amplitude, and the orientation of the plane on which the oscillation takes place, called the polarization. The amplitude is perceived as brightness. The larger the amplitude of the oscillation, the brighter the light. Notice how the brightness decreases as light propagates further from the source, and its amplitude decreases. The wavelength is perceived as color. The red color corresponds to longer wavelength than the blue color. But the electromagnetic radiation extends way beyond the limited range of wavelengths that our eyes can see on both sides. From the red side, it extends to the infrared, the microwaves and the radio while from the blue side, it extends to the ultraviolet, the X-rays and the gamma rays. The stars are sources of light of all wavelengths, but most of the interstellar radiation is concentrated in the optical and infrared range. We are less familiar with the third property of light, the polarization, which marks the direction of the oscillation of the electric field. There are many possibilities we could have horizontal linear polarization, vertical linear polarization, or diagonal linear polarization. We could even have circular polarization when the electric field vector traces a circle on the plane perpendicular to the direction of propagation. This is a right-hand circularly polarized beam, while this one is a left-hand circularly polarized beam of light. Natural light that comes out of stars is usually emitted with the electric field vector oscillating randomly on every possible direction. We say then that this light is not polarized, but polarization can be induced in the presence of a magnetic field which is our fifth ingredient and we'll talk about it later. First, let's talk about the fourth ingredient of interstellar medium, cosmic rays. 
After the discovery of radioactivity at the beginning of the 20th century, it was believed that the ionization of the atmosphere was due to ionizing radiation from the decay of radioactive elements in the Earth's crust. But to everyone's surprise, Victor Hess discovered in 1912 that this was not the case. He placed an electrometer on a hot air balloon and he found that the ionization of the air was increasing with altitude, indicating that the main source of ionization was coming from space, not from air. The Sun was quickly excluded as a source of the ionizing radiation and in the decades that followed, it was discovered that these ionizing cosmic rays, as were named by Robert Millikan, were not electromagnetic in nature, but rather high-energy charged particles like protons or heavier nuclei. For his discovery, Victor Hess was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1936. Today we know that cosmic rays can have a vast range of energies well over the highest energy that can be achieved by particle accelerators on Earth, like the LHC in CERN. But the higher the energy of the cosmic ray particle, the more rarely this particle is observed. The lowest energy cosmic rays are all around us. They penetrate the atmosphere and can be easily detected by simply devices like the cloud chamber that can be found in science museums. The cloud chamber is filled with super-saturated vapor of alcohol and dry ice. When a cosmic ray particle passes through, it ionizes the molecules of the vapor, leaving a long trail of bubbles. The higher energy cosmic rays do not make it to the ground. They interact with the molecules at the top of the atmosphere and create a shower of secondary particles that are then detected by a very large detector arrays, like the Pierre Auger Cosmic Rays Observatory in Argentina or the Hess Observatory in Namibia. While we think that most low to medium energy cosmic rays come from supernova explosions, the origin of the highest energy cosmic rays is not yet clear, but it has to be extragalactic. No matter the origin though, Cosmic ray particles are very important because they interact with magnetic fields, ionize the interstellar gas and drive the chemistry in dense molecular clouds. When cosmic rays collide with the gas and dust of the interstellar medium, gamma rays are produced that we can detect. This is what the sky looks like in gamma rays as detected by NASA's Fermi Gamma Ray Telescope. The plane of the galaxy is blazing in gamma rays as expected since this is where the most of the interstellar gas and dust are concentrated. There are few ways scientists use to detect and study the magnetic field that permeates interstellar space, and all of them involve the fourth property of light we talked about, polarization. The presence of magnetic field in interstellar space was first discovered in 1949 from the polarization of starlight due to interstellar dust grains that act as Polaroid filters. Natural light is originally unpolarized, which means that the electric field vector oscillates randomly in every possible direction on the plane perpendicular to the propagation of the beam. However, natural light gets polarized when it goes through a polarizing filter. The filter is made of long polymer molecules all aligned in one particular direction. The polarizing filter only allows oscillation in a direction perpendicular to its macromolecules to go through, while all the other ways the electric field vibrates originally are cut. These kinds of filters are used in polarizing sunglasses. The aspherical elongated dust grains in an interstellar cloud get aligned by the magnetic field that permeates the cloud. Dust grains are constantly spinning and align their axis of rotation with the magnetic field and thus act like the elongated polymer molecules in a polarizing filter. 
the light emitted from a star is originally unpolarized. But as it propagates through the interstellar medium, it could go through a cloud with its dust grains aligned with a magnetic field. Then, the light that emerges on the other side of the cloud is polarized in the direction of the magnetic field. This linear polarization of starlight, as observed in the optical part of the electromagnetic spectrum, traces the direction of the magnetic field. But as the dust grains are cold, they can also emit in the infrared. Since they are well aligned with the magnetic field, their emitted light is also polarized, but this time, in the direction perpendicular to the magnetic field. This method of studying the magnetic field in interstellar clouds is still the most popular one since regular optical telescopes can be used together with specialized instruments that measure the polarization of light called polarimeters. At the Skinakas Observatory, we use the 1.3 meter telescope and the Robopol instrument to map the magnetic field in the interstellar clouds like this example of the Polaris Flare Cloud around the North Star marked with a cyan star. The red segments indicate the polarization direction of light of a few hundred stars behind the cloud, tracing the direction of the magnetic field. As is usually the case, the morphology of the cloud is correlated with the direction of the magnetic field that permeates it. The different parts of the interstellar medium, the gas, the dust, the radiation, the cosmic rays and the magnetic fields are all important ingredients in the process of star formation. In physics, when we try to understand a phenomenon, we build models of it and we try to include only the essential ingredients and processes and leave out unimportant details. To decide which components are important, we look at the relative contribution to the total energy of the system. If some ingredient does not have an appreciable contribution to the total energy budget, then we can safely ignore it without losing the essential physics. The different parts of the interstellar medium have comparable contribution to its total energy budget. Star formation is a genuinely complex process with a lot of different ingredients, all playing important roles so that the process cannot be simplified by ignoring one or more of them. This explains why the star formation process remains an open research problem for over 70 years. Despite the efforts of generations of astrophysicists and the remarkable progress that has been achieved, this is briefly what we know for sure about the way stars form. We know that stars form in very massive and dense molecular clouds that appear dark in the optical because of all the dust that obscures the light of the background stars. As we saw, these clouds are very cold, and as a result, the dust grains in them emit in the infrared. We also study molecular clouds by mapping the emission of carbon monoxide in them. Thanks to the Herschel Space Telescope, we now have very detailed images of the nearby molecular clouds in the infrared, and we see the young stars being born there. Despite their huge masses and sizes, only a small part of the gas of molecular clouds form stars. Most of the cloud is inert, while stars form in small condensations inside the clouds called cores. These gaseous cores collapse under their own gravity to form one or more protostars surrounded by a thick disk of gas and dust. In these early stages of the life of the protostar, usually jets appear perpendicular to the disk that can extend to enormous distances on either side. A few million years after its birth, a protostar blows out most of its cocoon gas and dust of the core out of which it formed but the dusty disk remains and gradually it fragments into pieces that grow by accreting the surrounding material and form planets. With the extremely high resolution capabilities of the radio interferometer ALMA in Chile, we have observed such protoplanetary disks around many protostars with amazing diversity. 
Despite the wealth of data, there are many open questions about the star formation process. How do cores form? Why is it that only a small part of the cloud makes stars? What determines how many stars are formed from one core? How do jets form? Nowadays, scientists use powerful supercomputers made of thousands of processors to simulate the star formation process and gain insights about the underlying physical effects. The sophisticated parallel codes they use discretize space and time and solve the physics equations on a grid that can adapt to the needs of the problem. It is through the comparison of the results of such numerical simulations with the observations that we try to improve our understanding of how stars form. With the advent of more powerful computers and more powerful telescopes, we are looking forward to a bright future in this field, where many of our open questions will at long last yield to our efforts, and the secrets of stellar birth and stellar youth will finally be revealed.